Section 9 of the Fairy Tales of Charles Perrault. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Fairy Tales of Charles Perrault by Charles Perrault. Translated by Robert Samber and J. E. Manchin. Section 9 The Ridiculous Wishes. In days long past, there lived a poor woodcutter who found life very hard. Indeed, it was his lot to toil for little Gurdon, and although he was young and happily married, there were moments when he wished himself dead and below the ground. One day, while at his work, he was again lamenting his fate. Some men, he said, have only to make known their desires, and straightway these are granted, and their every wish fulfilled. But it has availed me little to wish for aught, for the gods are deaf to prayers of such as I. As he spoke these words, there was a great noise of thunder, and Jupiter appeared before him, wielding his mighty thunderbolts. Our poor man was stricken with fear, and threw himself on the ground. My lord, he said, forget my foolish speech, heed not my wishes, but cease thy thundering. Have no fear, answered Jupiter. I have heard thy plaint, and have come hither to show thee how greatly thou dost wrong me. Hark, I who am sovereign lord of this world, promise to grant in full the first three wishes which it will please thee to utter whatever these may be. Consider well what things can bring thee joy and prosperity, and as thy happiness is at stake, be not over hasty, but revolve the matter in thy mind. Having thus spoken, Jupiter withdrew himself and made his ascent to Olympus. As for our woodcutter, he blithely corded his faggot, and throwing it over his shoulder, made for his home. To one so light of heart the load also seemed light, and his thoughts were merry as he strode along. Many a wish came into his mind, but he was resolved to seek the advice of his wife, who was a young woman of good understanding. He had soon reached his cottage, and casting down his faggot, "'Behold me, Fanny,' he said, "'make up the fire and spread the board, and let there be no stint. We are wealthy, Fanny, wealthy for evermore. We have only to wish for whatsoever we may desire.' Thereupon he told her the story of what had befallen that day. Fanny, whose mind was quick and active, immediately conceived many plans for the advancement of their fortune, but she approved her husband's resolve to act with prudence and circumspection. "'Twere a pity,' said she, "'to spoil our chances through impatience. We had best take counsel of the night, and wish no wishes until to-morrow.' "'That is well spoken,' answered Harry. "'Meanwhile, fetch a bottle of our best, and we shall drink to our good fortune.' Fanny brought a bottle from the store behind the faggots, and our man enjoyed his ease, leaning back in his chair, with his toes to the fire and his goblet in his hand. "'What fine glowing embers,' he said, "'and what a fine toasting fire! I wish we had a black pudding at hand.' Hardly had he spoken these words when his wife beheld, to her great astonishment, a long black pudding, which, issuing from a corner of the hearth, came winding and wriggling towards her. She uttered a cry of fear, and then again exclaimed in dismay, when she perceived that this strange occurrence was due to the wish which her husband had so rashly and foolishly spoken. Turning upon him in her anger and disappointment, she called the poor man all the abusive names that she could think of. What? she said to him. When you can call for a kingdom for gold, pearls, rubies, diamonds, for princely garments and wealth untold, is this the time to set your mind upon black puddings? Nay, answered the man, "'twas a thoughtless speech and a sad mistake, but I shall now be on my guard and shall do better next time. Who knows that you will? returned his wife. Once a witless fool, always a witless fool. And giving free rein to her vexation and ill temper, she continued to upbraid her husband until his anger also was stirred, and he had well nigh made a second bid and wished himself a widower. Enough, woman, he cried at last, put a cheek upon thy froward tongue. Who ever heard such impertinence as this, a plague on the shrew and on her pudding? Would to heaven it hung at the end of her nose! No sooner had the husband given voice to these words when the wish was straightway granted, and the long coil of black pudding appeared grafted to the angry dame's nose. Our man paused when he beheld what he had wrought. Fanny was a comely young woman, and blessed with good looks, and truth to tell, this new ornament did not set off her beauty. Yet it offered one advantage— that as it hung right before her mouth, it would thus effectively curb her speech. So having now but one wish left, he had all but resolved to make good use of it without further delay, and before any other mischance could befall, 
to wish himself a kingdom of his own. He was about to speak the word when he was stayed by a sudden thought. It is true, he said to himself, that there is none so great as a king, but what of the queen that must share his dignity? With what grace would she sit beside me on the throne, with a yard of black pudding for a nose? In this dilemma he resolved to put the case to Fanny, and to leave her to decide whether she would rather be a queen, with this most horrible appendage marring her good looks, or a man a peasant wife, but with her shapely nose relieved of this untoward addition. Fanny's mind was soon made up. Although she had dreamt of a crown and scepter, yet a woman's first wish is always to please. To this great desire all else must yield, and Fanny would rather be fair and drug it than be a queen with an ugly face. Thus our woodcutter did not change his state, did not become a potentate, nor fill his purse with golden crowns. He was thankful enough to use his remaining wish to a more humble purpose, and forthwith relieved his wife of her encumbrance. The moral. Ah, so it is, that miserable man, by nature fickle, blind, unwise, and rash, oft fails to reap a harvest from great gifts bestowed upon him by the heavenly gods. End of the Ridiculous Wishes Section 1 of the Fairy Tales of Charles Perrault. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Fairy Tales of Charles Perrault by Charles Perrault. Translated by Robert Samber and J. E. Manchin. Little Red Riding Hood. Once upon a time there lived in a certain village a little country girl, the prettiest creature was ever seen. Her mother was excessively fond of her, and her grandmother doted on her much more. This good woman got made for her a little red riding hood, which became the girl so extremely well that everybody called her Little Red Riding Hood. One day her mother, having made some griddle cakes, said to her, "'Go, my dear, and see how thy grandmamma does, for I hear she has been very ill. Carry her a griddle cake and this little pot of butter.' Little Red Riding Hood set out immediately to go to her grandmother, who lived in another village. As she was going through the wood, she met with Gaffer Wolf, who had a very great mind to eat her up, but he durst not because of some faggot-makers hard by in the forest. He asked whither she was going. The poor child, who did not know that it was dangerous to stay and hear a wolf talk, said to him, I am going to see my grandmamma, and carry her a griddle cake and a little pot of butter from my mamma. Does she live far off? said the wolf. Oh, I, answered Little Red Riding Hood. It is beyond that mill you see there, and at the first house in the village. Well, said the wolf, and I'll go and see her too. I'll go this way, and you go that, and we shall see who will be there soonest. The wolf began to run as fast as he could, taking the nearest way, and the little girl went by that farthest about, diverting herself in gathering nuts, running after butterflies, and making nosegays of such little flowers as she met with. The wolf was not long before he got to the old woman's house. He knocked at the door. Tap, tap. Who's there? Your grandchild, Little Red Riding Hood, replied the wolf, counterfeiting her voice, who has brought you a griddle cake and a little pot of butter sent you by Mama. The good grandmother, who was in bed, because she found herself somewhat ill, cried out, "'Pull the peg, and the boat will fall.' The wolf pulled the peg, and the door opened, and then presently he fell upon the good woman and ate her up in a moment, for it was above three days that he had not touched a bit. He then shut the door, and went into the grandmother's bed, expecting Little Red Riding Hood, who came some time afterwards and knocked at the door, tap, tap. "'Who's there?' Little Red Riding Hood, hearing the big voice of the wolf, was at first afraid, but believing her grandmother had got a cold and was hoarse, answered, "'Tis your grandchild, Little Red Riding Hood, who has brought you a griddle cake and a little pot of butter. Mama sends you." The wolf cried out to her, softening his voice as much as he could, "'Pull the peg and the bolt will fall.' Little Red Riding Hood pulled the peg and the door opened. The wolf, seeing her come in, said to her, hiding himself under the bedclothes. Put the cake and the little pot of butter under the bread bin, and come and lie down with me. Little Red Riding Hood undressed herself and went into the bed, where, being greatly amazed to see how her grandmother looked in her night clothes, she said to her, 
Grandmamma, what great arms you've got! That is the better to hug thee, my dear. Grandmamma, what great legs you have got! That is to run the better, my child. Grandmamma, what great ears you have got! That is to hear the better, my child. Grandmamma, what great eyes you have got! It is to see the better, my child. Grandmamma, what great teeth you have got! That is to eat thee up. And saying these words, this wicked wolf fell upon poor little Red Riding Hood and ate her all up. The moral. From this short story, easy we discern what conduct all young people ought to learn. But above all, young, growing Mrs. Fair, whose orient rosy blooms begin to appear, who, beauties in the fragrant spring of age, with pretty airs young hearts are apt to engage. I'll do they listen to all sorts of tongues, since some enchant and lure like siren songs. No wonder, therefore, tis, if overpowered, so many of them has the wolf devoured. The wolf, I say, for wolves too sure there are, of every sort in every character. Some of them mild and gentle-humoured be, of noise and gall, and rancor wholly free, who tame, familiar, full of complacence, ogle and leer, languish, cajole and glance, with luring tongues and language wondrous sweet, follow young ladies as they walk the street, even to their very houses, nay, bedside, and artful, though their true designs they hide. Yet, ah, these simpering wolves, who does not see, most dangerous of wolves indeed they be. End of Little Red Riding Hood Section 7 of The Fairy Tales of Charles Perrault This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Fairy Tales of Charles Perrault by Charles Perrault Translated by Robert Samber and J. E. Manchin Section 7 Riquet with the Tuft There was, once upon a time, a queen who was brought to bed of a son, so hideously ugly that it was long disputed whether he had human form. A fairy who was at his birth affirmed he would be very lovable for all that, since he should be endowed with abundance of wit. She even added that it would be in his power, by virtue of a gift she had just then given him, to bestow on the person he most loved as much wit as he pleased. All this somewhat comforted the poor queen, who was under a grievous affliction for having brought into the world such an ugly brat. It is true that this child no sooner began to prattle, but he said a thousand pretty things, and that in all his actions there was something so taking that he charmed everybody. I forgot to tell you that he came into the world with a little tuft of hair upon his head, which made them call him Riquet with the Tuft, for Riquet was the family name. Seven or eight years after this, the queen of a neighboring kingdom was delivered of two daughters at a birth. The firstborn of these was beautiful beyond compare, whereat the queen was so very glad that those present were afraid that her excess of joy would do her harm. The same fairy, who had assisted at the birth of little Riquet with the tuft, was here also, and, to moderate the queen's gladness, she declared that this little princess should have no wit at all, but be as stupid as she was pretty. This mortified the queen extremely, but some moments afterwards she had far greater sorrow, for the second daughter she was delivered of was very ugly. "'Do not afflict yourself so much, madam,' said the fairy. Your daughter shall have so great a portion of wit that her want of beauty will scarcely be perceived. God grant it, replied the queen, but is there no way to make the eldest, who is so pretty, have some little wit? I can do nothing for her, madam, as to wit, answered the fairy, but everything as to beauty, and as there is nothing but what I would do for your satisfaction, I give her for gift that she shall have the power to make handsome the person who shall best please her. As these princesses grew up, their perfections grew up with them. All the public talk was of the beauty of the eldest and the wit of the youngest. It is true also that their defects increased considerably with their age. 
the youngest visibly grew uglier and uglier, and the eldest became every day more and more stupid. She either made no answer at all to what was asked her, or said something very silly. She was, with all this, so unhandy, that she could not place four pieces of china upon the mantelpiece without breaking one of them, nor drink a glass of water without spilling half of it upon her cloths. Though beauty is a very great advantage in young people, yet here the youngest sister bore away the bell. Almost always, in all companies from the eldest, people would indeed go first to the beauty to look upon and admire her, but turn aside soon after to the wit to hear a thousand most entertaining and agreeable turns. And it was amazing to see, in less than a quarter of an hour's time, the eldest with not a soul with her, and the whole company crowding about the youngest. The eldest, though she was unaccountably dull, could not but notice it, and would have given all her beauty to have half the wit of her sister. The queen, prudent as she was, could not help reproaching her several times, which had liked to have made this poor princess die for grief. One day, as she retired into the wood to bewail her misfortune, she saw, coming to her, a little man, very disagreeable, but most magnificently dressed. This was the young prince Riquet with the tuft, who, having fallen in love with her, by seeing her picture, many of which went all over the world, had left his father's kingdom to have the pleasure of seeing and talking with her. Overjoyed to find her thus all alone, he addressed himself to her with all imaginable politeness and respect, having observed, after he had made her the ordinary compliments, that she was extremely melancholy, he said to her, I cannot comprehend, madam, how a person so beautiful as you are can be so sorrowful as you seem to be, for though I can boast of having seen infinite numbers of ladies exquisitely charming, I can say that I never beheld any one whose beauty approaches yours. You are pleased to say so, answered the princess, and here she stopped. Beauty, replied Riquet with the tuft, is such a great advantage that it ought to take the place of all things, and since you possess this treasure, I see nothing that can possibly very much afflict you. I had far rather, cried the princess, be as ugly as you are and have wit than have the beauty I possess and be so stupid as I am. There is nothing, madam, returned he, shows more that we have wit than to believe we have none, and it is the nature of that excellent quality that the more people have of it, the more they believe they want it. I do not know that, said the princess, but I know very well that I am very senseless and thence proceeds the vexation which almost kills me. If that be all, madam, which troubles you, I can very easily put an end to your affliction. And how will you do that? cried the princess. I have the power, madam, replied Riquet with the tuft, to give to that person whom I shall love best as much wit as can be had, and as you, madam, are that very person, it will be your fault only if you have not as great a share of it as any one living, provided you will be pleased to marry me. The princess remained quite astonished, and answered not a word. I see, replied Riquet with the tuft, that this proposal makes you very uneasy, and I do not wonder at it, but I will give you a whole year to consider of it. The princess had so little wit and, at the same time, so great a longing to have some, that she imagined the end of that year would never be. Therefore she accepted the proposal which was made her. She had no sooner promised Riquet with the tuft that she would marry him on that day, twelfth month, than she found herself quite otherwise than she was before. She had an incredible facility of speaking whatever she pleased, after a polite, easy, and natural manner. She began that moment a very gallant conversation with Riquet with the tuft, wherein she tattled at such a rate that Riquet with the tuft believed he had given her more wit than he had reserved for himself. When she returned to the palace, the whole court knew not what to think of such a sudden and extraordinary change, for they heard from her now as much sensible discourse 
and as many infinitely witty turns as they had stupid and silly impertinences before. The whole court was overjoyed at it beyond imagination. It pleased all but her younger sister, because having no longer the advantage of her in respect of wit, she appeared, in comparison of her, a very disagreeable homely puss. The king governed himself by her advice, and would even sometimes hold a council in her apartment. The noise of this change spreading everywhere, all the young princes of the neighboring kingdoms strove all they could to gain her favor, and almost all of them asked her in marriage. But she found not one of them had wit enough for her, and she gave them all a hearing, but would not engage herself to any. However, there came one so powerful, rich, witty, and handsome, that she could not help having a good inclination for him. Her father perceived it, and told her that she was her own mistress as to the choice of a husband, and that she might declare her intentions. As the more wit we have, the greater difficulty we find to make a firm resolution upon such affairs. This made her desire her father, after having thanked him, to give her time to consider of it. She went accidentally to walk in the same wood where she met Riquet with the tuft, to think, the more conveniently what she ought to do. While she was walking in a profound meditation, she heard a confused noise under her feet, as it were of a great many people who went backwards and forwards and were very busy. Having listened more attentively, she heard one say, Bring me that pot, and another, Give me that kettle, and a third, Put some wood on the fire. The ground at the same time opened, and she seemingly saw under her feet a great kitchen full of cooks, scullions, and all sorts of servants necessary for a magnificent entertainment. There came out of it a company of roasters, to the number of twenty or thirty, who went to plant themselves in a fine alley of wood, about a very long table, with their larding pins in their hands, and skewers in their caps, who began to work, keeping time to the tune of a very harmonious song. The princess, all astonished at this sight, asked them who they worked for. For Prince Riquet with the Tuft, said the chief of them, who is to be married tomorrow. The princess was more surprised than ever, and, recollecting that it was now that day, twelfth month, on which she had promised to marry Riquet with the Tuft, she was like to sink into the ground. What made her forget this was that, when she made this promise, she was very silly, and having obtained that vast stock of wit which the prince had bestowed on her, she had entirely forgot her stupidity. She continued walking, but had not taken thirty steps, before Riquet with the tuft presented himself to her bravely and most magnificently dressed, like a prince who was going to be married. "'You see, madam,' said he, "'I am very exact in keeping my word, and doubt not in the least, but you are come hither to perform yours, and to make me, by giving me your hand, the happiest of men. I shall freely own to you, answered the princess, that I have not yet taken any resolution on this affair, and believe I never shall take such a one as you desire. You astonish me, madam, said Riquet with the tuft. I believe it, said the princess, and surely if I had to do with a clown or a man of no wit, I should find myself very much at a loss. A princess always observes her word, would he say to me, and you must marry me, since you promise to do so. But as he whom I talk to is the man of the world who is master of the greatest sense and judgment, I am sure he will hear reason. You know that when I was but a fool, I could, notwithstanding, never come to a resolution to marry you. Why will you have me, now I have so much judgment as you gave me, and which makes me a more difficult person than I was at that time, to come to such a resolution, which I could not then determine to agree to. If you sincerely thought to make me your wife, you have been greatly in the wrong to deprive me of my dull simplicity, and make me see things much more clearly than I did. If a man of no wit and sense, replied Riquet with the tuft, would be entitled, as you say, to reproach you for breach of your word. Why will you not let me, madam, 
do likewise in a matter wherein all the happiness of my life is concerned. Is it reasonable that persons of wit and sense should be in a worse condition than those who have none? Can you pretend this? You who have so great a share, and desired so earnestly to have it. But let us come to fact, if you please. Setting aside my ugliness and deformity, is there anything in me which displeases you? Are you dissatisfied with my birth, my wit, humor, or manners? Not at all, answered the princess. I love you and respect you in all that you mentioned. If it be so, said Riquet with the tuft, I am like to be happy, since it is in your power to make me the most lovable of men. How can that be? said the princess. It will come about, said Riquet with the tuft, if you love me enough to wish it to be so, and that you may no ways doubt, madam, of what I say. I know that the same fairy who, on my birthday, gave me for gift the power of making the person who shall please me extremely witty and judicious, has, in like manner, given you for gift the power of making him whom you love, and would grant that favor to, extremely handsome. If it be so, said the princess, I wish with all my heart that you may be the most lovable prince in the world, and I bestow it on you as much as I am able. The princess had no sooner pronounced these words, but Riquet with the tuft appeared to her the finest prince upon earth, the handsomest and most amiable man she ever saw. Some affirmed that it was not the enchantments of the fairy which worked this change, but that love alone caused the metamorphosis. They say that the princess, having made due reflection on the perseverance of her lover, his discretion, and all the good qualities of his mind, his wit and judgment, saw no longer the deformity of his body, nor the ugliness of his face, that his hump seemed to her no more than the homely air of one who has a broad back, and that whereas till then she saw him limp horribly, she found it nothing more than a certain sidling air which charmed her. They say farther that his eyes, which were very squinty, seemed to her all the more bright and sparkling, and that their irregularity passed, in her judgment, for a mark of a violent excess of love, and, in short, that his great red nose had, in her opinion, somewhat of the martial and heroic. Howsoever it was, the princess promised immediately to marry him, on condition he obtained her father's consent. The king being acquainted that his daughter had abundance of esteem for Riquet with the tuft, whom he knew otherwise for a most sage and judicious prince, received him for his son-in-law with pleasure, and the next morning their nuptials were celebrated, as Riquet with the tuft had foreseen, and according to the orders he had a long time before given. The Moral What in this little tale we find is less a fable than real truth. In those we love appear rare gifts of mind, and body too, wit, judgment, beauty, youth. Another A countenance whereupon, by nature's hand, beauty is traced, also the lively stain of such complexion art can ne'er attain, with all these gifts hath not so much command on hearts, as hath one secret charm alone. Love finds that out, to all besides unknown. End of Riquet with the Tuft Recording by Susan Burke, Boston, Massachusetts ZooBurkeVoice.com